welcome everyone to the 2022 Winter Lecture Series organized by the Georgia chapter of the American Statistical Association. It's my great honor to introduce Professor Shujit Khosh as the first speaker of this year's lectures. He is currently a professor and the interim head in the Department of Statistics at the North Carolina State University. He has over 25 years of experience in conducting, applying, evaluating, and documenting statistical analysis of biomedical and environmental data. Professor Ghosh is actively involved in teaching, supervising, and mentoring graduate students. He has supervised over 40 doctoral graduate students and was awarded the Cavill Brownie Mentoring Award at NCSU Statistics in 2014. Professor Ghosh has also served as a statistical investigator and consultant for over 45 different research projects funded by various leading industries and federal agencies. He has given over 180 invited lectures, seminars at national and international meetings. Professor Ghosh is a prolific researcher. He has published over 125 peer-reviewed articles in prestigious journals. He has co-authored a book titled Bayesian Statistical Methods. Professor Ghosh received a number of prestigious awards. He received the <clears throat> excuse me, IISA Young Investigator Award in 2008. Next year, he, he was elected as a fellow of the American Statistical Association. He was elected as the president of the NC chapter of ASA in 2013 and elected as the president of IISA in 2017. He was the recipient of the prestigious honorary doctorate in statistics at Hamasat University in Thailand in 2015. Furthermore, he has also served as the DMS program director at NSF in 2013-14. And during 2014-17, to 17, he served as the deputy director of SAMC. We are very honored that he agreed to deliver this lecture today. And as a token of our appreciation, we have a leg to give Professor Ghosh. Well, we see it virtually. Uh, I will mail it to you later. And uh, you know, without further ado, we request Professor Ghosh to give the lecture today. Uh, thank you so much, Abuda. Uh, it is a pleasure, and uh, it is uh, kindly inviting uh, me to uh, share some of my work that I have been uh, working on. And uh, it's a great honor and uh, privilege uh, to uh, get this opportunity uh, virtually. Uh, uh, so let me get started. So I've been working with uh, biomedical data uh, for some time. And we use a lot of those standard hazard models that I'm going to talk about. But uh, over the years, I've realized that uh, when we try to identify risk factors uh, that when you are comparing treatments and things like that, typically it is based on statistical model. And there's a uh, very popular saying, uh, this is uh, by George Box, all models are wrong, but fortunately some are useful. So here the goal is to find what are those useful models and that would be something that I'll be uh, talking about. So uh, the typically uh, it, it will get a little bit technical, proportional hazard, proportional law or uh, accelerated failure times and I'll get to that what those are. But basically it is trying to uh, model. So the uh, figure that you are looking at, these are called survival curves. That means it tries to find the probability that someone will survive beyond a time point. So if I take a time point here and look at uh, this uh, thing, so what is the probability that someone will survive beyond this time point? So, and then uh, you are looking at uh, different treatments. So the higher the curve is, the better the survival rate basically. But sometimes uh, some kind of uh, interesting situation arise and the standard statistical models uh, that are very popular in particular proportional hazard uh, assumption. And that was a seminal work by D.R. Cox, who we uh, passed away, I think last year, uh, uh, creates sometimes uh, some problem uh, in identifying risk factors. And why that is the case, that is the primary, I think, uh, 
intention of uh, my work I was trying to find why things are not going to work. And then we uh, worked out some solutions and there are some open problems that I'm going to come uh, towards the end of this talk. So that uh, if you are students or even someone looking uh, into this area might find some work uh, useful. Sorry, I think going the wrong direction. So uh, let's uh, begin with a very simple uh, example. Uh, in, in this case, uh, suppose there are two groups uh, uh, of uh, patients that, I mean, uh, treatments are allocated into two groups, one receiving uh, a chemo and another one receiving radiotherapy uh, and uh, along with that uh, chemotherapy. And we would like to know about which treatment is working uh, better. So basically we are trying to compare the health risk between the two groups. But these things are monitored over time. So, so that will, the, the thing that will complicate uh, uh, this type of matter. So T here, suppose denotes the time to cancer emission uh, since someone is, uh, has entered the study. And that is true for either of the uh, two groups. And this is what I mean survival function. This is the probability that someone will survive uh, given such some time points. So T, it could be in months, days, years, whichever time you need. And uh, if you are in a uh, chemotherapy group, then uh, there, there have a certain survival rates. And if you are in a chemo plus uh, radiotherapy, then you have a, a different survival function. So basically these are functions of time. So if we take a particular time point and then it is easy to compare. So that's what typically people do, what they talk about sometimes relative risk and so on. But we would like to see what will happen over the course of the entire survival until the person passes away or until death. But uh, because these studies sometimes take a long time, uh, they are getting censored. So C is a censoring time. And that happens because the study might run out of funding or some other reasons or patients might have left. Uh, so there might be various reasons. Uh, so what we get to observe is not the actual survival time, but the censored version. So it would be the minimum, if, if someone passes away or if the death occurs, then we get to observe the survival time. But if not, if someone is still uh, alive, which is a good thing, then we sometimes get to see only the censored uh, value. And then we also know who are censors of indicators. So in a sense, uh, for I subjects, uh, no matter which group they are, the ZI here will denote the group. ZI equals to zero is one group and one means another group. And uh, we make these assumptions and then these assumptions are uh, also assumes that T and C are conditionally independent. That is a very typical assumption. That means the censoring uh, does not uh, affect the survival time given condition on the covariate. Uh, so let's look at some uh, situations uh, to see uh, why there might be complications. So, Suppose I get to estimate the several functions for two groups, and there are various ways of doing that. Uh, the most popular one being Kaplan-Meier estimate, but there are many other things. No matter what, suppose after the estimate, uh, I, I get to see the survival curve, and this is for group one, and this is the dashed line is for group zero. So in this case, it is very clear that group one is doing better because if you are on this group, on this treatment group, then the survival rate is, uh, bigger than the other one throughout, no matter what time it is. And in this case, there is no confusion about which treatment is doing better. But, but now uh, let's look at this scenario. So here, uh, those that are on group one, uh, the survival rate is higher than those on group zero, but at certain time point, maybe around like 100 days or so, these things crosses. And now if I ask the question, uh, which group is doing better or which treatment actually you would prefer if you have to, if you have a choice uh, for this particular uh, disease, which one uh, you will be uh, preferring? So that becomes a bit difficult to answer because initially uh, the group one was doing uh, good, but after a certain time, uh, uh, group one is no longer, it is actually doing pretty worse. But this is not just a cooked up scenario just to make the things uh, 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 complicated. Why this type of things can happen is that there are some newer drugs which are very effective, uh, but at the same time, if you have seen any ad for any drugs, they come with possibly uh, 
75% of times why uh, you, uh, there is a warning level, which is 75% of times in their uh, drug ad. So they might be doing very well uh, in terms of survival rate. They'll keep a patient alive uh, uh, for a few days here, but it can be also very toxic. And then the patient starts to uh, uh, this adversely affect the uh, patients because it is very effective, but it can be very toxic. So the other drug, which is not as effective as possibly the new one, but uh, on the long run, uh, this is actually going to give a better survival rate. So in this case, possibly uh, one might choose the group zero instead of group one. But let's look at another case. Uh, in this case, uh, well, uh, if you now have got an idea what uh, these curves are. So again, group one is doing much better than group zero, but at the very end, there is a little bit of a crossing. But in this case, does this matter? Because the probability of survival here has gone down below like 10% anyway. So if there is a crossing towards the end, maybe this is not too much of a concern. So I have shown you uh, some kind of three scenarios and why these type of things can happen. Uh, the question is that uh, the typical models that we use in, in survival analysis or biostatistics, uh, can they answer or, or, or settle this type of problems? So let's look at a little bit, a little bit of uh, uh, in uh, depth. Uh, so cell function is actually a conditional uh, uh, function that means it is conditional on the covariate. And if you take uh, uh, derivatives of the log of that and with the negative signs, what you get is called a hazard rate. It actually has a nice interpretation. It is the probability of surviving in the instantaneous interval given that someone has survived beyond time t. So this, this has a, a interpretation, not just uh, uh, calculations like this. So a lot of times uh, that's the reason a uh, lot of models are uh, formulated in terms of hazard functions instead of the several functions. But there, there's a one-to-one -one relations. If you can estimate one of this function, uh, you can estimate the other because there is a one-to-one -one relation between them. So the proportional hazard basically tells you that if you look at the ratio of these two hazard function, it is no longer going to depend on time. And uh, so here, uh, for example, if eta is bigger than one, then one uh, group is not doing well versus the other. And equivalent, as, as I said, there is a one to a relation. So the several functions are, so th this equation and that equations are exactly the same. I'm just expressing in terms of hazard function versus several function. Accelerated failure time uh, is a little bit different model, but it is in terms of hazard, it looks like this, but in, this is actually much much more interpretable in terms of function. That means it tells you that uh, if eta is bigger than one, uh, in, again, in this case, one group is doing better than the other, and proportional odds uh, is also expressed like that. So uh, in a sense, uh, all of this is trying to capture uh, which group is uh, better, but within a certain model assumptions. And why this type of assumptions are made? Well, there are various reasons. I don't have time to get into all of those, but you can immediately see even for these very, very simple situations when you have just two groups, uh, the covariate is just a binary uh, covariate, Z is zero and one. And suppose uh, the two cell curves are not equal. If they are equal, then there is nothing to do. I mean, they're both are doing equally well. But if they are unequal, there are only two possibilities. Uh, all of these things, the eta, the eta parameter I'm using, but they have different interpretation, but I mean, this is still the parameter here. And this H0, and these are called baseline as a function or baseline uh, several functions. These are also uh, needs to be estimated and sometimes in proportional hazard, the reason it got popular that you don't have to actually estimate that to estimate the eta. So that was one uh, very uh, nice aspect of uh, fitting proportional hazard. So, uh, but now the eta can either be bigger than one or less than one. There are only two possibilities. If it is bigger than one, you can see that from no matter it is proportional hazard, accelerated failure time or proportional odds, this S1T will always be less than uh, the, uh, S0T. So that means group one is going to do worse than that. So, and it, so eta bigger than one, make, making uh, the uh, making sure that one group is really worse than the other for all T. And if it is less than one, it is the other way. But that tells you that all the, the two scenarios that I have just given an example of, which was this and that, 
uh, cannot be captured by any of these models because it doesn't allow the crossing of the cell function and hence uh, these models are not capable of uh, capturing those type of scenarios. All right, so uh, let's see. So uh, in practice, uh, this type of crossing does happen. So now those figures that I've shown you, those were based on some kind of a simulated uh, scenarios. But now for actual data, the data set that I just began with, with gastric cancer data, you can see that uh, this there is a crossing going on. But if I, so suppose I didn't notice that, I didn't fit this uh, Captain Meyer, but I just followed that uh, most popular pH model, I fit to the same data sets, because it does not have the capability of capturing the crossing. Uh, what it does, it will declare one to be the beta. So this, in this case, the chemo group uh, is uh, beta throughout, but there was a crossing here. So, and that's one problem you can see, right? So the thing is that uh, you should be uh, very careful about the assumptions made. And not only that, later on, I'm going to point out that this type of assumptions also uh, affect uh, the decisions you make in terms of choosing the risk factors, which uh, is a big one. So that means what, are, what is the uh, type of treatment uh, and the type of COVID and how they interact sometimes cannot uh, be understood if we wrongly make an assumptions or we cannot identify the risk factors as well. So, so that's the point. So uh, let's look at some uh, simulated uh, data scenarios again uh, to make this point and what can go wrong uh, in, in general. So I've shown you one example, but in this case, suppose I simulate data from a log normal distributions because these are uh, survival times. So these are positive value random variables. I simulate the sensor data for an exponential, and then there is this uh, a sensor uh, time, uh, several times that we get to see, along with the covariates and the censoring indicators. And uh, I, I, I suppose I simulate the model. So the, the case one here is, is no longer a pH or AFT, but the case two is an AFT. So we'll see what happens in that scenario. So let's look at this. So this is the ground truth. So that means because I'm doing simulations, I know what the true several curves are. Suppose this is the curve there. And suppose I want to see the difference in the survival rates at say time uh, 150 days. So that would be the difference here. So here group zero uh, is doing much better compared to group one at at least say 150 days. But because the crossing happened very early on, and that is one situation, as I said, can happen uh, if uh, this drug is very good, but then it becomes so toxic, uh, people started dying much uh, at a greater rate. So that's a realistic scenario. But if I fit a pH model to this type of uh, data, data generated from this model, they will declare there is no difference whatsoever because it doesn't, so because it was like that, and it, the difference at 150 is virtually nothing. So it will declare there is no difference. So it will definitely be a, a wrong thing to conclude just because I made a wrong model assumptions, uh, it, it might just say that there is no difference. But if someone is doing a little bit careful uh, analysis, then you will see that if you test for these assumptions, it will get rejected. And then maybe you should think about doing something else. And if I fit the kaplan meyer type models, then it captures the difference non-parametrically. So that's not a problem. So in the two group case, the kaplan meyer uh, I can do that. But if the covariate becomes continuous valid, uh, unfortunately, these scenarios uh, will no longer be applicable. But let's look at the other scenario here. There is actually no crossing of the several functions. So crossing is not the only problem. That's what I, I trying to point out. This is actually an AFT model uh, that data is generated. And then suppose I fit a Cox model to that without realizing that this model was generated from a non-proportional hazard model. Then the estimate, say again, I'm looking at the estimate at 200 days, what is the difference in the survival rates? It will be much more uh, elevated or inflated this. So it will show that one treatment is much, much better than other when in actuality it is not the case. Even top on that, if you try to test the proportional hazard, it not necessarily get uh, rejected. So here you will not be able to even identify that this was there is a problem. It's like almost Houston, there is a problem that is not uh, the case in this case. But if again, if I do a Captain Mar estimate, uh, it uh, kind of captures uh, this difference 
pretty well because it's a non proteric estimate and it, it uh, performs very well uh, in this two group case. So I hope uh, I met this case that when there is a crossing, the, the problem uh, you can see is like it will not capture the difference. And even if there is no crossing, but the two models are two groups are generated from different model, uh, it might uh, get an estimate which is too optimistic to be true at a given time point as well. So these are the problems with these models. But now let's try to uh, go beyond just two groups uh, because the, in the two groups, uh, there is no need to fit some of these models because I can just simply fit a couple of my estimated to different two groups and get the estimate, the problem will be resolved. But what if, if I have a uh, covariate which is no longer just binary value, but it's a vector value and it can uh, be continuous, discrete and so on. For example, it can include the blood pressure measurement or something called Karnovsky score, which I'm going to show later on, or the age, so and also, also the treatment and the cell types. So it can be uh, kind of a high dimensional one. These days, we always talk about high dimension one. So this is one point I'm trying to make, even if we are doing high dimensional inference, the variable selection, sometimes we don't pay much attention to the model itself that is being used to test the variable selection problem. I mean, a linear model, uh, if, if the model actually was at heteroscedastic variance and I'm doing variable selection without realizing that, it could lead to something erroneous result. So this is what uh, uh, you will see uh, that is going to happen because this type of models, you cannot write down, I mean, except for AFT, you cannot write down in a always linear model structure. So this is the most general version. So our goal is to basically estimate this conditional survival function uh, given a vector of covariate Z and the data is still like this. And now the Z could be a uh, lot many and not just uh, one binary indicator. And uh, once we can estimate that, we can estimate the hazard function as well. So in this case, uh, what is the typical generalization of this proportional hazard and accelerated failure time and proportional odds? Uh, that can be generalized to this. So for a vector valued Z, I mean, in this case, it would be a function. So eta was constant because there was just one Z, uh, 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 just a binary Z. But in this case, uh, this would, eta is a function itself. And here I'm uh, making some kind of a uh, additive model uh, assumption. <coughs> so uh, in or equivalently, the survival function can be written like that. So all of those three models can be, and many, there are many other models can be expressed either in terms of hazard function or in terms of survival function. And more generally, all of these models can be uh, written down in what is called time transformation model. So, so it can be written like in a typical way. So instead of regressing T on the some function, uh, you are regressing some function of T uh, on a regression function here. And some particular choice of G or this error uh, will give rise to this model. So this is a more general framework. But interestingly, even for this most general framework, it will not allow for crossing a soil function. So that, that was uh, uh, something. So, so this is possibly the most general version you can think of among this, but if we try to generalize all these three models, but even then uh, it doesn't allow for that and you will not be able to capture those type of things. So definitely I hope I convinced you that there is need for more flexible models than even the time transformation models. And so that was the driving force for uh, one of my PhD student thesis who graduated a few years ago, but uh, some of works are still ongoing. So uh, now the, we, what type of extension uh, are, so this is not the first time someone realized that there is a need for extension. Uh, so what type of uh, extension? So one is the time varying effect. So saying that instead of saying that uh, the proportional hazard, the coefficient that, that goes uh, uh, is also varying with time, but then you are breaking the proportional hazard assumption itself. So the appealing feature, uh, which makes easy interpretation of the proportional hazard is now gone and the estimation method is also becomes more cumbersome than it used to be. So if those things are all that the desired aspects of the proportional hazards are no longer uh, available, is there a need to keep that structure by making these things time varying? So, well, that's a philosophical analysis. I think this will resolve some of the problems, uh, uh, but at the same time, that's a philosophical issue about uh, modeling. 
And there is another one is called hazard regression, which is based on kind of uh, 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 first degree uh, splines models, which I'm going to talk about, which models a lot. So that, that actually takes care of some of these problems. So uh, let me, before I get into the type of solutions that we came up with uh, uh, a few years ago and something that are still remaining uh, remains as challenge, uh, we also worked on a, a problem. And because that's what I was interested, uh, if I make a wrong modeling assumptions and do a variable selection based on a wrong model, uh, will that affect the variable selection problem? I think this aspect is possibly a bit less addressed in the literature because whenever we do variable section, we kind of to take the ground truth model as if that's God gifted model and then do the variable selections. So the variables might be rejected, not because they don't have influence on the response, but maybe the model itself is wrong. Like the Cox model, you can see there was a big difference at 150 days, but because of the wrong modeling assumption, uh, that, that there was no difference. So someone would have said that, well, these two treatments were not different. But the reason was not that really there was no difference, but the model assumption was wrong. So what we, in general, what type of uh, uh, impact it will have? So I worked with actually one of our uh, 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 student who was visiting a summer program that we run and we are going to run again next one is called SIBS. Uh, and he later become a student in her uh, department, so Alvin's train. And uh, I'll just show you some results uh, with the interest of time, and you can look at our paper, which was published a couple of years ago. So uh, here there are lots of uh, uh, covariates, and they were given uh, uh, treatment combinations like this, and those were found to be uh, 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 significant in terms of uh, several function uh, differences. Uh, and but there are lots of other covariates that were there and are these uh, the legitimate risk factors as it affects. So the way we figured out, we, we fitted a, a particular model and then found this estimate. So to keep the uh, model simulation realistic, we didn't just assign some value to our advantage, but uh, we, we took this as like a ground truth. And then we, we simulate uh, data with these values uh, uh, using a pH model and or in this case, the true model is a proportional hazard. But, and if I fit the proportional hazard to that, it seems like uh, here I'm trying to show you how many times, and this is a simulated data experiment. So I, I generate the data, I fit the model, and then I see whether uh, this particular coefficient is statistically significantly different from zero or not. So 100% of the time it, it picks that. So this is good. And when uh, there was no effect of the drugs and so on, uh, it, it only uh, selects 3% of the time. So this thing tells you that if the model assumption is correct, uh, this type of variable selection uh, does pretty well. But if I fit a penalized uh, pH model, which is uh, uses some kind of a lasso penalty on when it uh, fits the uh, proportional hazard model, there is a way to do that without estimating the uh, uh, several, I mean, the baseline hazard functions. In this case, unfortunately, I mean, uh, here it doesn't do as good as that. I mean, the, it is still not bad. 70% of the time it selects this particular one. But uh, sometimes when there is no effect uh, of a particular covariate, it still selects 26% of the time as if this is an important uh, uh, variable uh, or risk factor to be included. And, uh, and it happens. So I have indicated in red. And then this is the uh, spline-based HARE model. And then this is there is a, there's a pH version of that. There's a non-pH version of that. And there is a time interaction. So you can see this model seems to be working fine when there is no effect. It only selects 1% of the time and so on. And when the effect is there, uh, it, it selects 99% of the time. So they, they are sim seemingly working fine. But the penalized uh, uh, pH in this case, so here we possibly don't need that. I mean, the number of COVIDs is not that huge. But if I use that, it might lead to biased result in terms of, sorry, uh, the selection. So now let's uh, suppose I generate the model in terms of uh, AFT uh, and uh, then what happens? So then the pH assumption uh, makes things worse. That means this, there was no such effect of this particular with that the type, whether someone has taken drugs or not. So that's the COVID and the Karnovsky score uh, if there was no effect of that. So this is the true ground truth the coefficient, and uh, it seems to pick up 62% that this is actually important. 
and uh, penalized one, I mean, again, does it, but the other model seems to do well, and you can see. So by doing this simulated data scenario uh, based on a practical uh, way of selecting the coefficient, it shows that uh, the assumptions someone makes on the model, and then if someone does a variable selection based on the assumed model, can impact the whole variable selection. So this is something need, one needs to be aware of and uh, do some kind of a sensitivity study. And I think uh, to my knowledge, this is not very often done. Uh, so, but this is something that, so that's why I said possible hazards of proportional hazard, uh, just making an assumption and going with the uh, standard penalized method uh, without paying attention to the actual model might be problematic. So now what do we do about it? Uh, well, uh, we, we came up with some other uh, ways of uh, estimating uh, the conditional survival, because as I said, if I can estimate the conditional survival function, I can estimate the hazard uh, rates as well. So to set up some notations, so this would be considering our right sensor data. In this case, first of all, with no covariates, let's try to get the biggest, otherwise that uh, notation gets a bit cumbersome. So in this case, uh, we assume this is a typical assumption. And uh, the livelihood function for this case, uh, uh, for a general hazard function will be uh, kind of uh, consist of a sum of this type of quantities, the log length. So the question is that how do I model the hazard function in general? And uh, this is called the cumulative hazard function, uh, which is just the integral of that. So if I can model the hazard function, I can model the I can get the cumulative hazard. So one way to do that is to do some kind of a, a basis expansion. So, and then assuming that this hazard function belongs to a certain function class, one can do that. And in this case, I'm writing a generic form. So what type of basis functions I can use? Well, I can use splines, B splines, or wavelets, whichever one uh, you want to use. Uh, but it needs to satisfy certain uh, conditions that hazard function should be non-negative. Uh, and also the integral from zero to infinity of the hazard function should be uh, kind of infinity. Otherwise it doesn't satisfy some of the desired condition. So, uh, but no matter what pre-specified the known basis function you choose, the hazard function can be computed like that. And fortunately it will be also kind of a linear function in gamma uh, because uh, of the uh, linearity of this uh, basis expansion. And as both uh, hazard and cumulative hazard are linear in unknown gamma, the model can be shown to be uh, have theoretical computational advantage. So what I mean by that? So I uh, use one of my favorite basis functions, Bernstein basis functions, but I mean, you can get away doing with base splines as well. But this actually has uh, some theoretical uh, properties. For example, in 1993, someone proved that if you're looking for safe constant inference, this is what one of my interest is. Uh, uh, this type of uh, polynomials, it is polynomials. It, someone might think this is too wild sometimes, but with the safe constant, it's not going to be too wild. Yeah, but one can show that uh, this actually provides uh, an optimal representation in some sense. What is a Bernstein polynomial? It's kind of given by this. I mean, this was possibly the first uh, time uh, Bernstein gave a uh, uh, kind of a constructive proof of the famous Westros theorem, which says that any continuous function can be estimated by a polynomial. The Bernstein actually showed that, that the polynomial is exactly something like that if X is on a compact interval. And zero one is not a problem because if it was some other interval, I can transform it to a zero one. So that's not a problem. And one can show that this convergence is uniform and it has very nice properties uh, if you go along. And in particular, uh, if I try to model the hazard function, uh, one can show this type of uniform convergence. So, and also uh, it needs to satisfy this. So I have to kind of tweak a little bit to make sure that it satisfies the properties of hazard functions. In this case, if I write down the hazard functions like this, and I take this to be the uh, Bernstein uh, polynomials, uh, and then if the gamma case are non-negative, and this thing actually makes the whole thing continuous and makes sure this condition is satisfied. Uh, so this model will satisfy all the required thing. And so it is not just uh, that, but interestingly, the whole likelihood function uh, in this case can be written down in closed form like this. And uh, if you do a little math, you'll be able to show that this thing is strictly concave. 
And so you'll be able to maximize this uh, unique. So the unique maximum does exist and you'll be able to find that using some kind of numerical uh, algorithms, uh, for example, optim in R. And uh, what we tried to show, and I may not have, uh, get uh, to show you the full uh, generality of that, but our paper shows that, interestingly, this simple form of the likelihood function actually remains true even if you include covariates. So remember here, I oversimplified that they, this model had no covariate. I'm just trying to estimate the hazard function without any covariate uh, based on sensor data. Uh, but even if you have covariate, it could be uh, binary, it could be continuous. Uh, uh, this type of form can still be written. So just to give a, a flavor of that, uh, if I had a, a, a binary covariate, then the hazard function can be written like this. And again, the likelihood becomes exactly the same form. But in this case, this U matrix and the V matrix, which are completely known because these are basis functions. So I completely know this uh, matrix. Uh, that would be getting uh, bigger size in size, but uh, sorry. Uh, so, but this form uh, remains the same. So this is interesting that, uh, that and if you have kind of a continuous uh, covariate, uh, you can actually show that uh, we can still keep this type of form. So basically it tells you that uh, at least in theory, uh, there's a unique maximum uh, uh, that will maximize this uh, uh, log likelihood and we'll be able to possibly find that using numerical routines. So uh, if you are interested in this, uh, you can see this paper, the reference would be coming up at the very end of this uh, presentation. And not only that, the, if you want to make inference, typically we use Fisher information uh, metrics. So this is like a non-chromatic MLE type estimation we are using a sieve approach. Uh, interesting, this one also has a closed form and it is a very simple, and this actually shows the why it is strictly concave. It is negative and this matrix is definitely a, a positive. It matrix the negative sign, it becomes negative definite and concavity is automatic. This is actually a proof almost uh, why it is that. But this can be computed exactly uh, once I have the estimate of the gamma uh, by numerical optimization. So now uh, let's look at some of the theoretical properties before I get into the applications of this. And there are some open problems that still remain, so we have not completely solved everything. Uh, but in order to show uh, some properties, how do I show that this is kind of going to capture the hazard function no matter what function space uh, they are coming from, so I have to make some assumption, but how do I uh, measure distance? Because these are functions. So I have to define some form of distance. So here I'm defining the distance almost like a Hellinger uh, metric. So that is a popular one. And then I have to make certain assumptions. You don't get any theory without making any assumptions, uh, but the minimal assumptions I have to make is that this is just continuous here. And if I want to get the rate of convergence, then I have to assume uh, it has some kind of older continuity of certain exponent. So these are some assumptions needed. And we take a sieve approach and then with some, uh, uh, with the help of some previous work, we'll be able to show the consistency in this uh, distance uh, sense. So this will be strong convergence and the rate can be given by this as well. So this one, uh, the rate depends on knowing that holder exponent. And uh, it would be nice actually to devise a method where we will be possibly able to uh, bypass knowing this thing. So this is something that possibly could be done in future, but it tells that uh, if the number of basis function increases with the uh, sample size with some power, where this power would be like this, uh, this thing not only converges, but it converges at this rate. And if you are into theory and things like that, you, I'll ask you to uh, uh, check out the paper. So, but now let's see uh, uh, what would be the impact of using this type of methods uh, um, and how these things actually perform in simulated data and similar to what I was just showing earlier. So in order to show numerical illustrations, uh, I have to, uh, get some measurement of the accuracy. In this case, I'm taking the integrated absolute error because uh, this is, we are comparing the survival function and because the function can be from zero to infinity, but I mean, if I choose a, a tau such that the survival rate is less than 0.01 percent, no one will care about uh, uh, this. This is a finite thing. Uh, and anything below that, uh, I mean, if the chance of survival is less than that, no one possibly uh, will bother about that. 
So that's why we, we took this uh, type of things. And now the smaller this one uh, is for a particular method, the better the method is, right? Uh, across any time point, not a, a single time point that I was showing like 150 days or 250, no matter what days they are, uh, they will be the case. So if I uh, generate data from the same log normal, the same log normal, the data that I showed you before, and uh, I use a sample size of 50 and do 1000 Monte Carlo runs. Uh, and uh, if I estimate using the BP, the kaplan meyer I mean, all of them seems to be working uh, well. In the this Bernstein based method are working a little bit. So here we are looking at the IE, the smaller, the better, remember. Uh, and uh, it is under no censoring. There is a 30% censoring. There is a uh, heavy censoring, like 50% censoring. Uh, and in this case, uh, the fully non parametric which gives unsmooth estimate, uh, is performing a little worse, but statistically speaking, it's not bad. And, but uh, what we also wanted to look at that, uh, this is the exact, uh, I mean, the median values of this IE times the 100. But we also are looking at among each of these 1000 cases, how many times BP was, uh, has the smallest IAE. So it turns out that 64% of times it is the winner uh, on the zero censoring, 61% on the 30% and 50%, 54% uh, on the 50% censoring. Uh, for the control group and for the treatment group is like that. So in most of the cases, it was uh, able to uh, achieve in the majority of the cases, uh, better performance than uh, either of these two non -prim. So this is the KM is the most popular after my estimate, which is gives you a non-smooth estimate and HERD gives you a smooth one, but still uh, it's a different way of modeling. They use splines and here I'm using Bernstein polynomials. But that was no covariate case. But if I bring in covariate case, and this is again that same AFT model, remember I showed you uh, the soil functions, and now I'm showing you the results that are generated from that this data and then fitting by different methodologies. So in this case, again, uh, the BP seems to uh, enjoy, uh, I mean, in this case, it, it wins 75% of the time, 76 and 71% uh, across all types of sensing that we have considered here. So, uh, uh, I mean, the, the mean function here was misspecified. I mean, here the mean function that we took something pretty strange just to see what happens. So because our method, the BP-based method doesn't make any particular assumptions uh, how the covariate gets introduced into, into this type of model. So it is a nonlinear uh, function of the covariate in this case, and Z is a continuous covariate in this case. Uh, looks like uh, the AFT actually, although this model is true, but if you misspecify the mean function, AFT assumption is correct the, in terms of a structure because it is the AFT structure. But if the mean function is taken to be a linear function in covariate, uh, it will perform pretty worse. Uh, you can see uh, in terms of IE like that, and it is never the winner. So, so this is interesting. In this case, the pH assumption is false, but still it performs relatively better than the AFT model when the structure is correct, but the mean function itself is incorrectly specified. So these are again pointing out to the things that sometimes when you are uh, making uh, uh, inference about identifying these factors, what model assumptions we are making should also be paid attention because you can see there will be a drastic difference in the result itself. And in terms of box plot, I mean, you can clearly see uh, this gives you the fuller picture of the previous cases. So I hope uh, this convinces that uh, this BP is a reasonable approach, at least in lower dimensional covariate case. So now uh, one has to think about how to expand these things to high dimensional situations, but before we get to that, uh, so my cautionary note is that be aware of assumptions. And if you have a problem, call 1-800, but don't call this, this is not a real number. This BPR is BP regression, HRA is regression for the risk group. But if you make a call, it will be going something else. It is just uh, for uh, fun, I just put that. So PH, AFT, PO, uh, all these type of assumptions, you have to be very careful when you are uh, doing risk factor identifications using these models. So let me uh, now get towards the conclusion uh, of the talk uh, with the, uh, real data application. And uh, this is uh, a very famous data set uh, in terms of lung cancer study. There were 137 patients, uh, male patients that were uh, enrolled and there were two treatment that they were trying to compare the standard chemo and uh, a new or a test chemotherapy. 
And there were like five other baseline uh, covariates, but following the previous work, uh, it is kind of well known this Karnofsky score uh, is one uh, of vital. Basically, it tells you the status of your health here. A zero means is that one is almost dead and 100 means a perfect one. So it's an index-based score. Uh, again, if you want to look up, just Google Karnofsky score, you will get to see that. And then it is well known for this type of lung cancer. Uh, the cell type uh, is an important covariant. And in this case, uh, it, is it a squamous cell uh, carcinoma or a small cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma or the large cell one. Uh, and what I'll try to show you that if you don't make this type of linearity assumptions when you are doing this type of model, be it pH, AFT or something else, you actually get to conclude something very interesting uh, that I think uh, some folks may not have seen this uh, uh, before uh, and I'll, I'll try to come to that. And in this case, I mean, uh, I have to select the number of basis functions. So here I just took this one because n to the power 0.5 gives you some kind of assumed optimal rate uh, using the theorem that I have shown. So in this case, it turns out to be 12. So it's not a huge number because 137, I'm using 12 basis functions to fit these things. And as I showed you uh, previously, fitting this type of models uh, is not uh, difficult because it's a strictly concave functions. So uh, any numerical method, a reliable one actually uh, converges pretty fast. So it is quite fast, uh, at least for lower dimensional covariant. So uh, in terms of quantum cell, I mean, one needs to see how this affects. So this is actually a very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, information someone needs to know, I mean, what type of uh, carcinoma this is, because what I'll show you that the type of treatment that one is uh, going to take based on a type of cell someone uh, is identified with, with that type of uh, cancer actually has a strong interaction. I think that might have been missed in some of these previous studies that have analyzed this data. And I hope I will be able to convince you why there is a need for this little more sophisticated modeling, which is not as simple as a pH model and so on. So let me show you some results uh, about that. So here I'm plotting the survival curves and uh, here uh, the kind of, and I'm looking at the number of days, uh, and in this case, just for illustration, although the I have the estimate for the entire survival curve, just for illustration, I'm looking at the survival beyond 200 days. And you can see how these things, but this is also going to be changing depending on what kind of score someone has. Although the kind of score is actually a discretized uh, value, but I'm plotting as like a continuous uh, values here from zero to 100. So if you look at these two uh, uh, difference, I mean, here the treatment and cell type. So one means someone is in treatment one, which is the standard chemo. And uh, this one treatment two, that means they are in the test chemo, but they are both on the cell type one. Cell type one was the squamous cell. So in this case, it looks like there is not much difference. If you look at this curve the, throughout, across the all uh, values of the country score, you can see at 200 level, the estimates that we get here, the estimates that we get here are not much different. But if uh, they are given the same treatment, that means this is the uh, test treatment, but if they had different cell type, so this is squamous cell and two, I think is the small cell. So if they had different cell type, there is a vast difference. So here, there is a much, much higher survival rate compared to this one, even under they are in the same treatment. But in this case, if they are both on of the same cell type and the treatments are different, again, you see a stark difference. So there is a very nonlinear interactions going on with this type of Carnot's score and the treatment and how it affects the survival function. And unless someone is letting this kind of full uh, non parametric method, uh, it would be hard to come up with this type of curvatures. Uh, I think uh, before our analysis, I haven't seen at least uh, this type of results. And uh, so that that is something interesting. And uh, if I look at the other cell type, so uh, in the previous one, I looked at the cell type one and two squamous cell in this one, but then there is adiocarcinoma and the large cell as well. Sorry, I'm going the other way. Okay. Uh, so if I look at that, Again, uh, this 
type of comparison is a bit hard to understand, but I mean, at least you can see these are the survival curves as the carbon score is varying continuously. That's the only way we, we could think of plotting because this is varying almost continuously. And then they are of different treatments. So across these two, uh, in, in a particular row, they have live on different treatments, but they have the same cell type. And ac according to this, they have different uh, cell type, but they are on the same treatment. And you can see a drastic difference uh, uh, in the results. And I think some of this was possibly and the first time we reported at, at that time. So uh, this tells you that the type of model you assume and the type of conclusion you make uh, is heavily dependent on the modeling assumption. And one must be careful about this. And I hope by this, I am able to convince you of that. So now uh, I'm going to make some concluding remarks and uh, um, kind of provide you some thoughts uh, about what else is still that there are lots of things that needs to be done. So first of all, uh, I hope I convinced that there is a need to think more uh, critically about the modeling assumption when it comes to uh, identifying risk factors. Uh, the methodology that we provided, uh, at least the livelihood-based method works pretty well for both categorical and continuous because they have the same livelihood function, which is in closed form. And you can write down the official information in closed form. And it is not that difficult compared to if you were trying to do proportional hazard. There is a numerical optimization needs to be done, but that is the same thing needed for proportional hazard. But you, you get a much more general model. Uh, the HERA model, there is also an R package to do that. And uh, we have shown in a simulation study, the BP seems to perform a bit better, but we don't have any theoretical uh, way to compare the rates of these two. Uh, but at least in numerical studies, we have seen better performance. So what remains to be done, and I'll uh, leave some time for you to ask questions. Uh, so these are in rates. So how to perform a data? So the way I have chosen the sieves in my Barnstein polynomial, which is basically the degree of the polynomial itself, uh, I just took uh, using some kind of a, the theoretical result into the power 0.5, but that's not really a, a data-driven choice. And maybe things will change. And we have seen that if I change the, um, uh, the data, it's kind of robust uh, up to some value. Because if you increase more, uh, some uh, the interesting thing is that some of the coefficient in that uh, basis expansion automatically uh, go uh, zeroed out because the coefficients are non-negative. And there is a nice paper. I mean, if you have not seen this, there's a very interesting paper. It says that you even don't need any kind of penalizations if you are doing a constraint generalized linear model. So in this case, if you're doing a, a linear model and you know the coefficients are all non-negative, you actually don't need to do any penalization. Uh, it will automatically zero out things. And that's actually, we have seen uh, that kind of thing happening with our model because we are modeling hazard functions. So the coefficients needs to be non-negative. So that constant is very natural to us, uh, yeah. but this work is still, uh, uh, I think uh, remains to be done. We, we haven't proved the results. Uh, can we develop an adaptive method that wouldn't require knowing um, such smoothness? So right now, the way I'm choosing this power, this power depends on the smoothness, uh, but of course, in reality, I don't know the smoothness. It can there be uh, data adaptive uh, method to do that? And can we expand this type of scenarios to uh, high dimensional cover? So the, I said that it, it kind of remains uh, strictly concave, but if it is high dimensional, that strict conca concavity is no longer preserved as it will happen with any uh, type of models where the number of uh, predictors is much bigger than the sample size. And with sensor data, it becomes even more uh, difficult. So this thing uh, is something in the works. Uh, I think a, a Bayesian type of methods uh, will, will work, uh, but we haven't finished the work. But this is another result that tells you even from a frequentist perspective, uh, this type of results might be applicable to our cases. So, uh, with that note, I think uh, I come to our conclusions and I'll take questions. And these are some of the references uh, that you are interested to work in this area. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And if you have questions, I'm willing to answer that. Thank you, Professor Ghosh. Uh, we open the floor now for questions, comments, and discussions. Please unmute yourself and ask the questions that you may have.
Okay, I, I'll ask a question. Uh, on the, the last example you gave. So this is Dr. Reeves from the University of Georgia. Okay. Um, the sample size, you have 137 male patients, right? Right. But the, um, there's two treatments and there's four kinds of cell types, but I doubt it's really that balanced, right? I mean, unless you've designed it, whatever. So, you know, in the end, you're showing all those, uh, you know, little, little graphs. You say, so it depends on which cell type you have, the one, two, three, or four, and of course, which treatment, and then, of course, the Karnofsky score, whatever. But I mean, in some of those cells, how, how many people do you really have? How many type four people do you have under treatment two? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's if it was balanced, it'd be about 17 each, but I bet some of those are really small. Yeah, but I mean, uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question, and that's a, uh, uh, should be a con. But here, I mean, uh, they are not uh, equally spread, like it is not like 25% uh, each, but uh, I mean, because there is that the model actually borrows information uh, across right. this, so, so that way, uh, I mean, but uh, you are right, I mean, but. There's nothing I, I could do here. No, no, there's nothing you could do about it. And you're trying your best to borrow it. I, I agree. It's yeah. This is great. You've done. But, but, you can, but this is a concern. Yes, definitely. I, I mean, but they, what you're saying is, yeah, they're really different. If you start starting putting things together, no, it's not linear. It's not a shift and whatever. But you know, you're getting all those very different curves of you know survival probabilities based on these things. But I'm just thinking some of those are based on pretty small samples, even though you're borrowing from other ones. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, so there, there is a, oh, I mean, I didn't uh, present that. I mean, uh, I, I could have plotted also uh, the uncertainty band around this curve to show how uh, much difference they are. So in, in the paper, I think we give that because it will possibly make these things too busy to it if I start adding the bands around these curves. Right. Uh, uh, but yes, I mean, uh, that's definitely uh, something uh, I, I think uh, one, one, the only way to get around is to uh, enroll more patients. But you know, uh, as you know very well, that uh, enrolling more patients is costly and may not be possible sometimes, or if I use a larger data sets. Uh, but uh, some of those differences are quite statistically significant. Right. I mean, if, if I look at that, I mean, Without, sorry, I'm going the wrong direction. So, uh, for example, in this case, I mean, they are so much different. I mean, you, you can see that without I, even looking at uh, the uncertainty bands, I mean, these things are definitely uh, significantly uh, different. Uh, and so, but some of these things, I mean, whether there is a statistically different thing, you cannot possibly judge that based on this small, so, uh, small sample size, but. For this type of cases, uh, or across this, uh, we, we can see that that is possibly the, I think there is a signal there, there is a strong difference between these uh, two cell types and the treatment. And I mean, at least, uh, I mean, the, the interaction, the nonlinear interaction that happens between treatment and cell type is quite evident. And if I make uh, just a simple linear model-based assumptions, this type of things doesn't get captured. And we, we have actually also simulated data. I mean, again, I'm not presenting it here uh, uh, with larger sample size. This would become even more prominent sure. with larger sample size. Okay, thank, thank you. I was just a breaking point up though. I think it's, it's great. No, this is definitely, a, 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 I think a very valid point. And uh, yeah, unfortunately small sample size problem will always <laughs> remain uh, for us. Okay, uh, Dr. Ghosh, there are some questions in the chat. Would you like to address those? Starting sure, with I the think software. so. The first one I see is uh, uh, Michael software. Jones. Is there a software? Well, this was has been, uh, I think, my desire to uh, create an R package. We, we have R functions that I have shared with uh, 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 folks. And I think our journal paper where we posted with the, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure, but uh, there is no R package yet. So, so this is something that needs to be possibly done uh, and create, uh, created. But we, I have R functions, if you're interested, I can send you that. Uh, so the next was Frank's question, small sizes, couldn't small area estimation methods be used to elevate this? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I haven't uh, thought about that. Uh, uh, maybe uh, we need to talk uh, uh, offline uh, how this could be uh, done. 
uh, but this is, I mean, the, the borrowing of information possibly would be something that, that would be needed, but this is something that I think uh, would be worth exploring. And I think Scott has, uh, if you have two covariates, x1 and x2, and the model and assumptions speech are reasonable, to the next one have investigated. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, in that uh, paper that uh, uh, Alvin and I is showing and goes the 2020 paper, we actually have a few more uh, simulated studies where we try to see, I mean, if you simulate from an AFT model and fit a pH model and so on, uh, how these things affects. But in general, our conclusion is that uh, anytime this model assumption is violated, the selection of the covariate are significantly affected. Uh, so, so having a flexible model assumption uh, would almost be necessary if we really are careful about selecting the risk factors. So the thing that you were mentioning, if you have two covariates, uh, which, I mean, when you say uh, one satisfies the pH other, so you are possibly thinking of an additive form uh, of the uh, pH model, uh, then, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Th this would possibly uh, affect the variable selection uh, if you make just a pH assumption for the entire model. But uh, I mean, this course that we have, maybe one can do a simulator study to see actually exactly what happens, but I'm pretty sure that is what is going to happen uh, if we were to show the effect of model, sele model selection on variable selection. I think those are the questions that I can see so far. Yeah, are there other questions or comments? So great talk, Dr. Ghosh. I have a question. Um, okay, I so, know you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. So how, how does this models like with the um, once time poly polynomials compare with the um, cubic splines? Are they, do they give similar results? Uh, yes, I think uh, those the splines, because B splines, cubic splines, or natural spine, splines. I mean, they are possibly in terms of uh, asymptotic rates, they will be almost the same. Uh, and but in terms of writing down the model uh, in that form, I think it is still going to be possible. But for Bernstein polynomials, the reason I, I chose that is that you don't have to do the not selections and so because it is automatically chosen. And in terms of asymptotic theory, they will possibly achieve almost the same rates. So you don't get a, a theoretical advantage, but it has an implementation advantage. But uh, in theory, I think that, that will also work pretty well. Yeah, I possibly I'm a little bit biased uh, in favor of Bernstein, but because I've been using that for a while for a lot of, of my applications. The main motivation comes that uh, when you have shape concept, the reason we were using that in a different work, we were trying to model hazard function, which has a particular shape like bathtub and things like that. There are lots of models in reliability where they want a particular shape restriction. And it is easier to do that uh, just using the restriction the, co the coefficients of the Bernstein polynomials, which is also possible uh, for the splines uh, up to certain order, uh, but uh, it's just a bit easier, I find. Uh, I'm, I'm Yichuan. Uh, thank you uh, for your wonderful talk, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, I just follow uh, Dr. Paul's question. So do you make uh, some comparison for your method with the existing method in terms of coverage rate and ambulance? So we, uh, the only model we could compare uh, at that time was this uh, here HRE model. So uh, mm -hmm. let me see. Uh, oh, sorry. So uh, this is the comparison we did uh, uh, when the data were generated from AFT model. And so the HARE also kind of is a good competing method. It doesn't make uh, those type of pH or AFT models. It, it allows for cost and cell function, things like that. So we did compare and it seems like, I mean, uh, it, it performs, uh, when the BP performs slightly better, uh, actually not slightly, I mean, here significantly, 75% mm. of the times, 
it achieved the smallest AE uh, in this type of scenarios. We haven't compared, uh, I mean, in terms of coverage rate, but given that it achieves the smallest AE, I, I assume that that will also be the case. Oh, okay. Uh, so how about the, then the computation cost? It, uh, it is actually the advantage. Yeah, that is actually a, an advantage of the uh, uh, model. But the re reason is that, let me see. Uh, uh, so the thing is that uh, here, oh, the the, la the log likelihood function is can be written in a very simplistic form. So mm. and so computational cost is almost instant. I mean nothing because uh, this is a strictly convex function. And interestingly, uh, that if you have covariates uh, or no covariates, if you have a discrete covariate, continuous covariate, or a combination of that. In a way, you can always express these things like that for some matrix U and some matrix V. Mm. And uh, so the same uh, optimization method works. And not only that, uh, let's see, uh, the future information has a closed form. So there is, I, th I think it is possibly much simpler even than a HRE model or some other models when you are trying to estimate the um, uh, the uncertainty or estimates of, of uncertainty of these estimates because of this closed form uh, expressions it is much more easier. So once you get the estimate of the gamma, you just plug that in to get an estimated Fisher information if you want, because there is nothing else needs to be done. And this is true, no matter what type of covariates you have, this is the same form. That, that was, I think, uh, one thing we found very interesting that it could be done uh, even for these complicated models. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any more comments or questions? If not, uh, let us thank the speaker for a wonderful talk. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. It was really nice having you here. And it was our great pleasure. Uh, well, you... it, is, it is a pleasure for me. Thanks for inviting me uh, and thanks for the questions. Uh, if you have further questions, you know how to reach, to, reach out to me. I'll be uh, happy to answer later on.